Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Imam Abu Hanifa, several biographies have been written about Imam Abu Hanifa. And many of the things that people sort of have heard um, from others or have heard at different conferences or have heard from, you know, you read in a book here or there a little bit about Imam Abu Hanifa, many of those are well known. So many of those points are well known. Some of the points that people have heard about Imam Abu Hanifa, for example, there's very famous stories that they used to call Imam Abu Hanifa the peg. The reason they used to call Imam Abu Hanifa the peg is because he used to pray for 40 years, he used to pray Isha and, and Fajr with the same wudu. So for 40 years consecutively, he would be standing in the masjid all night such that he didn't go to sleep, that he could use the same wudu from Isha for Fajr, and so they used to call him the peg. So you'll hear this story. Another story that you'll hear is that Imam Abu Hanifa was so righteous that one time a sheep was stolen in his village. And Imam Abu Hanifa, for seven years after that, gave up eating sheep meat. And the reason why he gave up eating the meat of sheep was because he said that the lifespan of a sheep maximum is seven years. So I don't want that my tongue touch the meat of that stolen lamb, therefore for seven years I will not eat sheep meat, because nobody knew which lamb was stolen within the village. And another famous thing that's, uh, that's talked about is that uh, Imam Abu Hanifa, they, some people say that, for example, his, uh, Imam Abu Hanifa, actually, his father one time was walking in a forest. And as his father was walking through the forest, he saw, he was walking along the river, he saw an apple come down the river. And so as he saw that apple, he picked up the apple, and he took a bite of that apple, and actually ate that apple, and then began walking further up the river. When he got further up the river, he saw Imam Abu Hanifa's father, that is, he saw a whole orchard of trees, of apple trees. And he was shocked. And he actually realized that what he had eaten was wrong. It was haram. Because that orchard belonged to somebody else. And so he ate an apple out of that orchard without the, without have, it's as if he stole that apple. Because he didn't ask anybody for that apple. He had actually just found it randomly. And then he realized that it belonged to the owner of the orchard. So he went to the owner and he knocked on the door and he said to the owner, will you forgive me? And the owner said to him, I won't forgive you. So Imam Abu Hanifa's father was crushed. He was a very righteous man. He said, well, how can that be? What will I have to do in order to make you forgive me? I cannot, leave this, I cannot live in this world knowing that I created, that I did this sin. So then the father said, well, I have a daughter and she's deaf, she's dumb and she's blind. And if you agree to marry her, then I'll forgive you. So Imam Abu Hanifa's father was stuck. He said, well, I can't go in front of my Lord with this sin and this person's not going to forgive me so I have no choice so Imam Abu Hanifa's uh, father then agreed to marry the girl then on his wedding night when he actually went into the room to meet the girl the woman began speaking to him and he looked at the woman and she was very she was very attractive and she could hear everything that he said so he was shocked so he went back to the father of the girl and he said well what do you, you said your daughter was deaf, dumb and blind how can it be that she's sitting here and speaking in front of me? He said, yeah, she's deaf. She's deaf in the sense that she's never heard a lie and she's never heard anybody backbite. And she's blind in the sense that she's never seen anybody that's not her maham. And uh, she's dumb in the sense that she never, she's never sp spoken a lie or backbite in anyone else. So that was, you know, that's another famous story about Imam Abu Hanifa, that that was his father and that was, that was his mother and that Imam Abu Hanifa was the product of that. Now, given all those historical narrations, there's a very important thing that you need to understand about history when we discuss history in the Islamic context. And that is, is that these stories are extremes. When you hear history like this about the different a'imma, they're considered extremes. And when you have extreme stories to this degree, you have to have a proof that is just as powerful to establish the, that particular narration. And in the life of Imam Abu Hanifa, we don't have a proof like that. That's the first thing. So these stories may be true, they may not be true. That's the first point. Second point. These kind of fantastic stories that you hear about the different a'imma, these are not the proof of their greatness. Imam Abu Hanifa's having stood up for 40 years, whether he did it or not, is not the proof of his greatness. And people who have devoted themselves to an Islamic life will know that greatness doesn't occur in one night or with one particular action. Rather, greatness is a, is a consistent effort towards doing good and remaining on that effort from birth to death. That's what's considered great. And in one of the histories that I read for Imam Abu Hanifa, he, he mentioned all these points. He said, these stories are great, 
But these stories put them aside because these don't tell us anything about Imam Abu Hanifa. We don't learn about Imam Abu Hanifa. What was he really like? What was his everyday life like? What, how did he used to treat his students? Why did he begin studying? What were the things that he did? What were the books that he read? These are the more important things. And what, how was he consistent from day one to the very last day he took his breath? How was he regular in his actions and his studies? What, how did he develop himself? And why did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept his work to such an extent that half the ummah acts upon the way that he derived fiqh from the Quran and the hadith? So, I think that's a more important thing to know about Imam Abu Hanifa. So I put all those stories in the very beginning because they may be true, they may not be true. But let's just put them aside because we want to know who Imam Abu Hanifa was as the man, not as some saintly figure away above us. So the first point to understand is that the best description of Imam Abu Hanifa is from his student, Qadi Abu Yusuf. And Qadi Abu Yusuf was asked by Harun al-Rashid that, tell me about Imam Abu Hanifa. Now the amazing thing about this story is that Abu Yusuf, when he was asked to relate the life of Imam Abu Hanifa, didn't go and say, Imam Abu Hanifa didn't eat sheep for eight years, or his father and mother were such miraculous people. He gave a very simple description. And in fact, this is the true description of a true person who you should respect and look at. He said, as far as I know, Abu Hanifa was extremely pious. He avoided all the forbidden things, and he remained silent, and he was absorbed in his thoughts most of the time. He answered questions only if he knew the answer. He was extremely generous, self-respecting, never asked anybody for a favor, and shunned the company of anyone who was worldly-minded. He held worldly power and position in contempt, and he avoided slander and talked only well of other people. He was a man of profound learning. He was generous with his knowledge as he was with his wealth. And then on hearing this, Harun al-Rashid said, you have described the most incredible man. See, this is the essence of Islam. Not that you did one particular act that was amazing, but that you lived your life consistently, day in and day out, according to the Sunnah and the Quran, such that you became a model for the students that studied under you. That's what Imam Abu Hanifa was. He was an incredible human being. He was an incredible teacher, and he was an incredible student for when he studied under his teachers. And then he developed an incredible methodology for looking at Quran and Hadith. Those are the things that make Imam Abu Hanifa, may Allah be pleased with him, unique. So, let's talk about some of the sort of daily aspects of his life. Like, number one, his birth. Imam Abu Hanifa was born in Kufa. And his actual name was Nu'man. Nu'man ibn Thabit. Nu'man ibn Thabit. He's also known by his kunia, which was his nickname, meaning Abu Hanifa. And he's also known by the nickname Imam al-A'zam, the greatest Imam. He was born in 80 after Hijrah, the year 80 after Hijrah, and he lived to 150. He was born into a family of tradesmen who were actually of Persian origin. And they were descendants of Salman al-Farsi. He, it's said that his father actually uh, met uh, Ali radiallahu an, and he asked Ali to make a dua for his progeny, and Ali radiallahu an made a dua for his progeny, and Imam Abu Hanifa, some people say, was a result of one of the results of that dua. As far as his childhood, he was born early enough that he actually met four different Sahaba. He met four Sahaba in his lifetime. Some people say he actually narrates hadith from those Sahaba, that's debated, but he met four, if not seven, Sahaba during his lifetime. So that puts him in the category of Tabari. Tabari is defined as a person who saw one of the Sahaba. If you saw one of the Sahaba in a state of Iman, you get the classification of Tabari. And the Prophet ﷺ has said different things about the Tabari to um, sort of establish their veracity and their greatness. That the best generation is my generation, then the one after them, Yani the Sahaba, then the one after them, Yani the Tabari. In another hadith, um, it said, or in another riwayah, it might be from a sahaba, that the best are the people, are my generation, the most honest are my generation, then the most honest after them are the generation after them, then the generation after them, and after that you can't trust the people. So there's different things to establish the greatness of the tabarin, and Imam Abu Hanifa was one of the tabarin. When he was born in Kufa, Kufa had become a great city of learning a tremendous center of learning. And this was actually due to the efforts of Abdullah ibn Masood. Because the Prophet ﷺ, after the death of uh, the Prophet ﷺ, Abdullah ibn Masood was sent to Kufa. And in Kufa, he began to teach hadith and riwayah to such an extent that every single household in Kufa, the majority, 
were so caught up in riwayah and hadith that they all, that's all they used to do. That was the pastime in Kufa. And when Ali radiallahu an visited Kufa later on during his khilafah, he saw, when he saw the, every single house was so absorbed in learning, he himself said, what Abdullah ibn Mas'ud has done, I've never seen anywhere. And he congratulated Abdullah ibn Mas'ud for doing it. So it was the work of Abdullah ibn Mas'ud that actually established this learning within Kufa. And Imam Abu Hanifa was born into that um, situation. Now when Imam Abu Hanifa was young, he was not interested in studying Islam at all. And many of us have that exact same history in their background. He, had, didn't, he was religious, he was righteous, but he wasn't interested in learning, although he was extremely brilliant. One day... He walked by, coincidence, he walked by one of the imams in Kufa whose name was Sha'bi. Sha'bi was actually a very, very famous scholar. And he called Abu, Imam Abu Hanifa and he said, ya, ya, he called O Abu Hanifa, whose student are you? So Imam Abu Hanifa looked at him in the face. And the reason why he asked this question was because everybody in Kufa was a student of somebody or another. The learning was just so in, in, in vogue there that everybody had a, t- had a teacher. Every single person had a teacher. So he said, whose student are you? Imam Abu Hanifa said, I'm not a student of anybody. I haven't been studying. So then the person said, I see intelligence in your face. Sha'bi, Imam Sha'bi said to him, I see intelligence in your face. And from that day, and then he sent Imam Abu Hanifa to one to, uh, sheikh to study. And from that day on, Imam Abu Hanifa was to take the path that would lead to Nu'man becoming Imam. So that's an important thing about his background. Now, he acquired his knowledge from over 4,000 teachers. He had a wide array of teachers all over the Islamic uh, Khilafah at that time. Many of them were very prestigious, and he himself met some companions, as we talked about earlier. Uh, at the age of 22, he joined the study circle of his sheikh, who was to become his primary sheikh in learning, Hamad ibn Sulaiman. Hamad became his sheikh, and he was a well, Hamad himself was a well-known debater and hafaqih, and somebody who understood how to derive law from the Quran and Sunnah. And Imam Abu Hanifa actually became his student, and then at the age of 40, Imam Abu Hanifa himself took over that circle of learning. He also spent some time studying in both Mecca and Medina, and he studied under some of the biggest ulama at that time, who were actually um, uh, sahab, who were not sahaba, but who were also tabi'in. So he studied under some of them. And very, very famous ones, including Atta ibn, ibn, uh, Atta ibn Abi Rabah. And that particular uh, scholar is very famous in the sense that Abdullah ibn Umar, who was the son of Umar, who was very famous for relating so many different hadith, when Abdullah ibn Umar was asked different masail about fiqh and about the sharia, he would say, why do you ask me when Atta is alive? Why do you have to ask me? Go ask him. And Imam Abu Hanifa was one of Atta ibn Abi Rabah's students. Now, uh, he was also one of the students of Ikrama. If any of you know about the scholars of the past, Ikrama was one of the greatest scholars of the past. So he was also his student. And uh, he had several other famous uh, teachers. Imam Abu Hanifa, once he took over the study circle of his Sheikh Hamad, began to develop his methodology of analyzing the Quran and the Hadith and the different sayings of the Sahaba. Those were, the, those were essentially the three different sources of law that they had at that time. Now, different people write about Imam Abu Hanifa's study circle. How did he run his study circle? What were the characteristics and the qualities of it? One famous alim writes that one time he visited Imam Abu Hanifa's study circle, and he saw that Imam Abu Hanifa, somebody would come and ask a question, so that all the students would be studying, and somebody would come and ask a question, and then Imam Abu Hanifa would put the question to his students. In that particular study circle that this person visited, Imam Abu Hanifa had 1,000 students in that study circle. 40 of them were mujtahid. So you can imagine the incredible amount of devotion that these people had and the incredible amount of knowledge that was present within this one study circle. Then he goes on to relate that whenever the question would be asked, Imam Abu Hanifa would put it to his students. And these 1,000 students and the 40 mujtahideen within them would then discuss the question between them then they would relate it back to Imam Abu Hanifa based on the Quran, Hadith, and the call of the Sahaba and the Ijma' of the Sahaba, what the decision should be. And then based on that, they would say, Allahu Akbar. And then Imam Abu Hanifa would tell the scribe, write down the fatwa that we're giving for this particular case. So that was one example of his study circle. Uh, in another, another quote from Imam Shafi'i, he said that in the field of religious knowledge and in worldly affairs, there is only one person to whom I'm grateful. 
and that's Imam Muhammad. And Imam Muhammad was actually the second greatest student of Imam Abu Hanifa. Imam Shafi also said that what I learned from Imam Muhammad, I have written on a pack animal load of books. Meaning, they used to take the way they used to judge their books back then was they had animals. And they would load their books on both sides of the animals and they would walk with their animals and their animals would carry all their books after they were done studying. So they didn't have printing presses. You couldn't go to the, just the store and buy a book. So as, you are, as you're doing here, they would take notebook and they would write everything the teacher would say and that would become a volume. And then they'd go study another, under another teacher and write everything the teacher would say and that would become a volume. Such that they, had, they would then have their animals carry these, these loads of books and Imam Abu Hanifa, uh, Imam Shafi'i says that he learned one full animal load from Imam Muhammad. And Imam Muhammad again was one of the greatest t- uh, students of Imam Abu Hanifa. Everything, I- Imam Shafi'i himself said that Imam, that all the children, um, he said that all the men of knowledge are children of the ulama of Iraq. And all of them were disciplines of the ulama of, were disciples of the ulama of Kufa. And all the ulama of Kufa were disciples of Imam Abu Hanifa. Imam Shafi'i himself is saying this, that Imam, he's giving you the, great, the greatness of Imam Abu Hanifa. Now, Imam Abu Hanifa was the first to organize the writings of fiqh under subcategories. So, for example, Bahara, and then under Bahara, Wudu. And what are the faraid of Wudu? What are the sunan of Wudu? What are the adab of Wudu? What are the things that break the Wudu? What are the makruhat within Wudu? And we'll see, you'll see we're going to cover each of these different subcategories as we continue with the course. Now, after that, when the different aima came, Imam Malik, Imam Shafi'i, Imam Ahmad, Imam Bukhari, Imam, um, uh, Imam Muslim, Tirmidhi, Abu Dawood, all these people followed the pattern of Imam Abu Hanifa. Imam Abu Hanifa divided the Messiah, for example, those things that relate to breaking of wudu. Then you see in Imam Bukhari, he brings a chapter, the chapter dealing with breaking of wudu, the chapter dealing with the pillars of salah, the chapter is dealing with the timing of salah, the chapter dealing with adhan. This whole concept of dividing knowledge in this set way was established by Imam Abu Hanifa and then followed by the ulama that were to come after him. Physically, Imam Abu Hanifa was considered to be a very handsome man. He was mild height. He's said to have good looks. He had very handsome features and a well-proportioned figure. His speech was considered to be extremely eloquent to the extent that even when a mas'ala would be extremely complicated, when it came off the tongue of Imam Abu Hanifa, it became so simple that the people wondered why they even debated that subject themselves. So his ability to explain, to take a difficult situation, to analyze it, to break it down and present it back to his students was a thing that made him noteworthy among his students. He was a man of extremely high taste. He was very wealthy and he loved to wear nice clothes. He loved to show that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had blessed him with wealth. And he wasn't ashamed of showing it. He wore very clean clothes and he wore very nice clothes. During his time, there was the, another separate setup politically in that there were, very, there were rulers that ruled throughout the Islamic empire. Imam Abu Hanifa believed that you should keep yourself very distant from these rulers. So as a teacher and as somebody who was, had the responsibility of, dis, of developing the Islamic Sharia, he kept, very, he kept himself distant from those rulers. He would teach them, he would answer their questions, but he would never accept a favor from any of those rulers. And in fact, within the, within the Hanafi Madhab, there's a very strict prohibition on taking money for teaching, on taking money for teaching the Qur'an, on accepting gifts for teaching or giving fatawa. And this is one of the things that Imam Abu Hanifa established as a rule. He was very careful about. Now, as a merchant, his business was extremely large scale. In today's millions of dollars millions of dollars of transactions yet he was very careful not to gain a cent of money that would have been have any potential of haram one time he sold he was sent he sent some lengths of silk to Hafs uh, Abdul Rahman to sell and he gave detailed instructions that I want you to sell this bundle of silk but know that in the middle of the bundle when you unwind the bundle there's a defect in the middle of that silk I want you to show the buyer this defect before they buy this particular cloth. The person who Imam Abu Hanifa had sent with the cloth forgot to do so. When, Ima, when he came back, Imam Abu Hanifa said, he had came back, he sold it for a very high price. Imam Abu Hanifa said, what happened? What, what did he say about the defect? The person said, I forgot. I forgot to tell about the defect. Imam Abu Hanifa gave all the money away immediately. He would not accept even a chance of, dis- of disturbing the purity of his wealth. Within his wealth, he had a set amount that he would donate to the muhaddithin, a set amount that he would donate to the qurra, a set amount that he would donate to his students in order for them to pursue this knowledge. So he was very, very 
careful about his wealth and very careful about how he used it. As far as his mannerisms were concerned, one day someone attended the circle of Imam Abu Hanifa and said to Imam Abu Hanifa, began cursing Imam Abu Hanifa. He said to Imam Abu, Hanifa, Imam Abu Hanifa, I can't believe you came up with that ruling. You're this kind of person, you're that kind of person, you're that kind of person. He continued throughout the entire circle in front of all the students of Imam Abu Hanifa such that when the circle was done and Imam Abu Hanifa got up to go home, Imam Abu, he continued to curse Imam Abu Hanifa. He kept following him to his door and he was cursing Imam Abu Hanifa and then when Imam Abu Hanifa came to his door, Imam Abu, Imam Abu Hanifa turned to him and he said, Oh my brother, if you have anything else to say to me, curse me now because I'm about to go into my house and you may not have a chance to later. So this was his mannerism. He was very mild-tempered and he was very, very, into his, very, very devote, devoted to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and was willing to accept these kind of acts because he realized that they were from Allah. They were a direct result of what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had sent to him. Finally, as a neighbor, how was Imam Abu Hanifa as a neighbor? Imam Abu Hanifa as a neighbor, it comes in one relation that he had a neighbor who used to actually get drunk very often. And the neighbor would get drunk, he would cook meat and eat meat with his friends, and then the neighbor would begin to sing this song that, who is there in the world to look after me? I have no one in the world who looks after me. This was Imam Abu Hanifa's neighbor. Every night, Imam Abu Hanifa would stand in his house for prayer. He would hear this person sing the same song in a drunken state, yet never went and disturbed this neighbor. Every night, over and over and over again, he would wake up for tahajjud and he would hear this neighbor, and yet he would not go and disturb him, respecting the privacy of his neighbor. One day, Imam Abu Hanifa stood up for tahajjud, and he didn't hear the voice of the neighbor. And he began to worry. He said, where is my neighbor? The next morning when he woke up and went to the city, he realized that his neighbor had been arrested for bad conduct within the street. Imam Abu Hanifa stopped his study circle, got on his horse, took his horse to the governor's palace. When the governor heard that Imam Abu Hanifa was coming, he sent all of his missionaries to, to, to receive him. He himself got off his throne and set, set Imam Abu Hanifa down on, on the throne. He said, what can we do for you, O Imam? Imam Abu Hanifa said that my neighbor is a drunk. You guys put him in jail last night. I want him out. This is what I have to do for my neighbor. Imam Abu Hanifa got him out and then put him on the horse, walked him back towards home, and on the way home said to him, now tell me who is there that, that, that hasn't answered your song. Meaning the song the man used to sing was, who is there to help me? I have no one. I have no one in the world to help me. Imam Abu Hanifa helped him and then he related the song to him back and said, look, I was extremely ashamed and said, I want to join your study circle. How can I join it? Imam Abu Hanifa said, you're more than welcome. That man then came to that study circle regularly every single day and became one of the mujtahideen within that uh, study circle. That was Imam Abu Hanifa, how he used to respect his neighbors. Now, his piety. His piety is, you can't even discuss. The Zahabi himself writes that the accounts of the piety and devotion of Imam Abu Hanifa have come to us from so many chains of transmission. I've heard about Imam Abu Hanifa's piety from so many ulama, and from so many people, and from so many teachers, that there is no way it can be in doubt. Meaning it's come to us with tawatur. This is what they used to say about, about Imam Abu Hanifa, about his piety. One time, one of the famous people of his city, was, who was very well known for his worship, came to visit Imam Abu Hanifa at Isha. He saw Imam Abu Hanifa was actually sitting and crying, reciting an ayah over and over again. His beard was wet with tears and he was sobbing and breathing heavily. Imam Abu Hanifa was. The person decided that I shouldn't disturb the Imam right now. He's very close to his Lord. I'll come back at Fajr and talk to him. So the person went, to, went home, went to sleep, came back Fajr the next day. When he came back Fajr the next day, he saw Imam Abu Hanifa sitting in the exact same place, sobbing the exact same way. And Imam Abu Hanifa was saying under his tongue that, uh, he was saying under his tongue that, Ya Allah, you are the graceful one. I am the one who sinned. Is there any room for, in, for Nu'man in your Jannah? This was Imam Abu Hanifa. He had reached that maqam and he's crying and saying these things. So he had reached an extreme degree of piety. Now, Imam Abu Hanifa's daily routine. How did he live his everyday life? I mean, isn't that important for us to know? How should we model our lives after him? Well, every day after morning prayer, he would, he would sit with his class in the masjid. He had his regular students who met him every day, and they would sit in a circle and they would study. So that was the first thing they would do. Then they would actually take questions for fatawa, and all of them would sit in a circle and they would answer the questions together. And this would go all the way until Zuhr, and all these different things were recorded. At Zuhr, Imam Abu Hanifa would go home. If it was the winter, he would actually go and spend time with his family. If it was the summer, he would take a short nap and then spend time with his family. By the time Asr came, they would have a second round of teaching. 
They would again gather and he would teach a new group of people. After that, he would teach for a short period of time and between the time for Asana Maghrib, he would then go around the city. He would visit sick, he would visit relatives, he would feed the needy. Those were the things that he liked to do between Asana and Maghrib. After that, for after Maghrib, there was a third session. A third session when all the, stu- when all the students would sit and learn and he would teach. Then that would go until Isha. After Isha, all studying was closed and he would devote himself to private devotions all night. He would sleep a portion of the night and then pray a portion of the night. And this is what, this is what he did every single day. Regularly, consistently, such that Noman became Imam Abu Hanifa. Now, how was Imam Abu Hanifa as a son? He had a mother, he had a father, how did he treat them? Well, Imam Abu Hanifa's father died at a very young age. And Imam Abu Hanifa's mother actually lived to very old age. So, what's really famous about Imam Abu Hanifa's mother is that during the time that Imam Abu Hanifa lived in Kufa, everybody was involved in the deen. Everybody, every house, every child, every parent, everybody was completely devoted to the deen. And there were a group of people who were the preachers of Kufa. There were a group of teachers who taught Adam, who taught knowledge, who would make sure that people would get their, their knowledge correct. But then there were another group of people who were considered the preachers. They would come into the masajid and they would give eloquent speeches about Islam and raise people's iman and get them excited about the deen. And this was a separate group of people who were professionals at this. They were considered the preachers. Now, most people in Kufa who didn't understand knowledge would often go to these preachers to ask because you tend to go to the person that's the most evident, the person that happens to speak the best. And so people in Kufa would often go to these preachers and Imam Abu Hanifa's mother was one of them. So what Imam Abu Hanifa's mother would do is when she had any question about fiqh, instead of taking it to Imam Abu Hanifa, who was the greatest faqih in Kufa at that time, Imam Abu Hanifa's mother would say, I want you to take me to Amr. Amr, who was this great preacher, and let's ask him the masala. Let's ask him what he says. So Imam Abu Hanifa would actually take his mother on the, ca- on the camel to the preacher, and then together they would ask Amr what the an- or Amr what the answer was for that particular question. Now imagine this, Imam Abu Hanifa, the person who people are coming from all over the Muslim empire to take fatwa from, himself is taking his mother on his camel to Amr, to Amr, who himself did not have this knowledge but was a preacher. Who was his goal was to just teach or just to encourage people. When Imam Abu Hanifa would show up with his mother, Amr himself would say, what are you asking me for? You're Imam Abu Hanifa, you answer the question. So often what they would do is, Imam Abu Hanifa would tell Amr the answer beforehand and then Amr would repeat the answer and then the mother would be satisfied. One time, you know, on, on occasion, Imam Abu Hanifa's mother would say, okay, my son, what do you think? Right? And sometimes the mother turns to the son. She said, you're Imam Abu Hanifa, you have all these students, you have 1,000 students, you have 40, 40 uh, fuqaha within your circle, what do you think about the masla? Then Imam Abu Hanifa would give his answer, she said, you don't know anything, take me to Amr. So then he would take her back to Amr, and then Amr would give the exact same answer. But this was, I mean, this was the way he treated his mother. He didn't say, I'm the faqih, why don't you ask me? Why don't you ask me what the answer is? Amr doesn't know, he's just a preacher. He himself took his mother and let her get the answer that, he want, that she wanted. So this was just a beautiful way in which he uh, interacted with his mother. His taqwa, we've already talked about, his legacy, a very beautiful hadith uh, in both Bukhari and Muslim, that the Prophet Sallallahu said that even if the religion, even if, even if the deen were somewhere far away, in the, uh, in, for example, another planet, even then, a person from Persia would have taken this hold of it, or from somebody among Persian descent, and would have found that deen. Were Islam to be some, at some far away, intangible place, the Prophet ﷺ said in a hadith from both Bukhari and Muslim that there would come a person from, a, from Persia who would take this deen and bring it back to the people. And Imam Suyuti, who's a very famous muhaddith, one of the greatest ulama of our, of our ummah, himself said that many scholars are unanimous upon the opinion that this hadith is talking about, Imam, about the coming of Imam Abu Hanifa. So that's Imam, that's Bukhari and Muslim. You can't ask for anything more. Muttafaqun alayh. The hadith is Muttafaqun alayh. And Imam Suyuti, one of the greatest imma, a Shafi'i himself, is saying that I thought, and many of the scholars that I studied under and taught thought that this hadith was about Imam Abu Hanifa. So it shows you that his legacy was incredible. His taqwa was incredible. And the proof is in the pudding. 50%, over 50% of the Muslim ummah today follows the method by which he, which he used to derive from the Qur'an and the Sunnah. More, the majority of the Muslim empire, for the majority of its time, in the majority of its courts, in the majority of its lands, has dealt and judged according to the madhab of Imam Abu Hanifa. His methodology of looking at the Qur'an and the Hadith has been used across the board.
1400 years of it. Now, this, this is a statement from the Prophet ﷺ. There's also another famous hadith in which the Prophet ﷺ said from Imam Abu Hurairah, Abu Hurairah, related to Imam Muslim, that we were sitting in the company of, Allah, of Allah's Apostle Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Surah Al-Jum'ah was revealed. And he recited it amongst them. The Prophet ﷺ recited it amongst them. And they said, and then said, uh, he then questioned of, of some question. And, and Samar uh, al-Farsi was amongst them. The Prophet ﷺ placed his hand on Samar al-Farsi's chest and said that even were this deen to be placed in some far away intangible place, somebody from amongst your descent would bring it back to the people. And we talked, we talked, we talked about earlier that Imam Abu Hanifa's family was from the, from the family of Salman al-Farsi. Now, Imam Abu Hanifa, I talked about his madhab, that's the proof. All the stories, they don't mean anything. The proof is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accepted him. That's the proof. The proof is in the pudding. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accepted him such that the majority of the ummah, for the majority of the time, in the majority of the land, in the majority of its courts, have ruled according to this madhab. Ruling according to this madhab means they've analyzed the Quran and the hadith according to the way that he outlined how you should look at it. That's essentially what a madhab is, and you're going to get to talk about this tomorrow, inshallah. What does it mean? What does madhab mean, etc. Now, the Imam al-Hanif actually died in the year 150. One foot, when, uh, 150, he was actually put in prison four years before that. He was then uh, by Mansur, who was one of the, who was a Khalifa at that time. Mansur sent him to prison because Imam Abu Hanifa refused to work for the government. He refused to work in a court. He was sent to prison, but then Mansur began to realize that Imam Abu Hanifa has way too many students. And unless those students are allowed to continue to learn from Imam Abu Hanifa, there is no way that Mansur will be able to keep his popularity, so Mansur let him out. Later on, when he saw how much popularity Imam Abu Hanifa had developed, Mansur became jealous. He, poisoned, he put Imam Abu Hanifa back in jail and then poisoned Imam Abu Hanifa. And Imam Abu Hanifa passed away in 150 after Hijrah. 